I have a, a, viv- a, a few experiences of this that I know might shock some of you. And that experience is times when I feel really old. It happens especially when I'm working with youth, right? And I talk about things like phones. I remember a time before I had a smartphone. I, I remember the time when I didn't think I needed a smartphone. I, believe it or not, was around before there was an iPhone, right? Anyway, I bring that up because this morning we're talking about signs, about God's covenant, the, the rainbow, and the sign that it represents, and the sign that it is to people. And, and I say I remember a time before iPhones because I remember a time before there was GPS. You know, a time when you might print off on MapQuest the directions. And I remember telling a, a youth at one point uh, about that experience or about the experience of getting out an atlas because I did a number of road trips because I went to college in South Uh, Southern California, and I was from Minnesota, so every semester I would drive from one end to the other so I could have a vehicle in the LA area because as if you've been there, you know having a vehicle is almost essential to get around and do the things that are fun for a college student. And so I had to get out the page, right, if I was in Colorado and see where I was at, if I, you know, Nebraska, wherever I had driven through, I'd get it out. And, and I was telling the youth, and they're just like, their mind was blown that you couldn't just like pull out your phone and just say, Starbucks, and it takes you there, right? And, and then during that time, one of the things that was critical is when you either needed coffee, food, or needed to take a break, right? You would be desperately searching for the signs that are ahead of you. You know, the, the, so, the town that was 30 miles away, 20 miles away, or the rest stop that was coming up, you know, you know it was like the one that was in Nebraska, and it's only until you have started to travel that road a number of times that you get a rhythm of when you need to stop and where you need to stop. But the signs are essential, and they give you this sense of relief even before you get there. They even give you a sense of hope. You know, when you show up on the screen or on those blue signs and you see the restaurant that you want. I know some of us who live in Hawaii don't really know that experience all too much, but if you've driven through mainland, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Signs tell us where we are. They tell us where we're going. They give us a sense of hope, a sense of direction. They do all sorts of things. And God gives for us a sign. God gives for us the sign of the rainbow, an everlasting covenant that never again will God put a flood over all the earth that would destroy all the flesh of the earth. Think about that. See, one of the things that I know is that sometimes people see the church from the lens of the flood and not the rainbow. What I mean by that is when I think of church signs and what people often portray about God to the public— I often think about the signs that you might see in downtown Waikiki of the person that's holding it and with the megaphone saying, repent, you are a sinner, turn from your ways, which is a Lenten phrase that many people say. Or you might see the humorous church street signs that show up in your Facebook memes or different things. Or perhaps they're hurtful street signs from churches. But what's that public sign that we say? In fact, I think sometimes our theology itself portrays a sign of a God of the flood and not a God of the rainbow. Because we like to think of God punishing the sinners. Some people like to think of, uh, of the idea that you have to say, I, say the specific set of words, do the specific set of things so that you avoid eternal damnation. And it's hard to hear. Some people say specific lifestyles, specific ways of being in the world, if they don't conform to certain standards, are, in fact, something that God might judge. God is the God of the sign of rainbows. Immediately after this, Noah makes a mistake again, right? Immediately after this scripture, Noah goes and he gets 
drinks, plants a vineyard and drinks too much wine. And there's all sorts of things in his family dynamics that happen. And that's the story of the table that we talk about, right? That God's love is faithful and that we turn our backs. And God's love is faithful and that we turn our backs. And Jesus and this journey to the cross, our journey to that Easter Sunday is not a journey of judgment, of God needing to bring the hammer down on someone so it brings it down on Jesus. But it's a journey of victory, of hope, and of love. Some people have a hard time with the image of the cross. I, in fact, know some churches that have taken it out altogether. I'm not trying to say that's what we, want, we should do, but they have a hard time because the cross to them cannot be separated from the judgment and the punishment. Unwilling to accept a God that would allow his own son to die just to appease that God's wrath. But to me, the cross symbolizes something greater than that. God's victory over death. There's so many ways to view what's called in theology atonement. What does the cross do? And for me, what the cross does is proves to us God's triumphant defeat over the powers that be, and the most existential one for us all is the power of death. The sign of the cross, the sign of the rainbow, to me portray not the judgment of God, but the love of God, and God's steadfast commitment to never leave us. And over and over again in the scripture passage, you hear that refrain that never again will this happen. Never again will this happen. And yet, we find ourselves amidst a global pandemic that surely, I promise you, some people are saying is God's wrath upon this earth. Those of us who know the scripture would come back to the rainbow to remember that God will not place judgment and destroy the people for that purpose. Instead, the sign of God is the sign of love. That's what signs do, after all. They venerate. They allow a window. They, they speak to something behind the sign, either the social contra- construct or, or the hope that you have for that rest stop, or a God who loves us and will never, ever leave us. The sign of the bow in the sky. I think sometimes the world sees the signs of judgment, the signs of I don't know, the ones that we portray most loudly. When I think what people need more than anything is to see the sign of steadfast love. And friends, that's what this Lenten journey is really about. Seeing the sign of God's love. amidst the hustle and bustle of our normal day life, amidst all of the anxieties and fears that we might have, whatever is coming our way, sometimes we neglect to see the signs. And it's not just the rainbow, like in the book of Genesis. Through our lives, God gives us all sorts of signs of God's love for us. Sometimes we neglect to see it, to pay attention, 
to take it in. And so I think that there's a twofold question I have for us this morning. How do you see signs of God's love? And then, how do we become that sign in the world? That is, after all, what Christians are called to be. Bearers of Christ's image in the world. The church is referenced over and over again as the body of Christ. The physical representation of God's love on earth is us. We are that sign. How do we see it? How do we reveal it to the world? That's what our Lenten disciplines are about. Perhaps the the lunch that you're giving up once a week is an opportunity to take your normal rhythm and set it aside and to see differently. Perhaps you might use that time to discern, to pray, to call someone that you know is going through a hard time. How do we see God's love and reveal it? That's what the journey is about. The journey of Lent. And so we invite you to journey with us. To continue to commit to that discipline. That on Ash Wednesday we talked about is more about what we take on than it is about what we give up. Giving up only creates space for us to develop the habit of good. The habit that allows us to see and to reveal God's love. Friends, I strongly believe that those who don't go to church want to hear and see the church proclaim the sign of the rainbow and not a damnation or fire and brimstone. Friends, that's our Methodist heritage. Resist evil and do all the good we can. Open hearts, open doors, open minds. God's love will always be with us, even now amidst the pandemic. How do we see it? And share that with each other. Post it in the comments on Facebook. Send it to the church and we'll try to re-message that. What are the signs of God's love for you? And now this week and the weeks to come, how will your disciplines help you be God's love? How will it help you be literally a a sanctuary, a presence of God's love that when others see you, they might get a glimpse? And that's not to think more highly of ourselves. In fact, if Jesus teaches us anything, it's to think less of ourselves, to humble ourselves, to give of ourselves. To maybe say to ourselves, hmm, I might not know. Or you have something of value to say. Because it's not about telling people what they need to do to get to heaven. It's about telling people about the God of heaven who will never leave them 
and has come to them in Christ and given all of us a path that is more powerful than any other journey or path that we set ourselves on and can defeat even the greatest power of death. Let us be renewed by the hope of the sign of the rainbow. I invite you to pray with me.